Welcome to Everyone's a Millionaire podcast, where we explore the world of wealth and finance and provide insights and inspiration to help you achieve your financial goals. Do you ever dream of becoming a millionaire but don't know where to start? Or perhaps you're already on your way to accumulating significant wealth but want to learn more about the strategies and habits of other successful millionaires. In this podcast, we'll bring you interviews with successful entrepreneurs, investors, and financial experts, as well as research-based insights and practical tips to help you build and grow your wealth. We'll cover topics such as how to invest in stocks, real estate, and other assets, how to manage debt and save for retirement, and how to build a mindset for financial success. Whether you're just starting out on your financial journey or you're a seasoned investor already looking for new insights and ideas, Everyone's a Millionaire is the podcast for you. So sit back, relax, and join us as we explore the fascinating world of wealth and finance. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Everyone's a Millionaire. I am your host, David Dodge, and today I am joined by a fellow real estate investor, entrepreneur, businessman. This guy rocks. I don't know if I've ever met Alex in person or not, but I've known him for probably like six or seven years, and we've done some other podcasts together, and I know he does big things, and I'm excited to get him on the show today, Mr. Alex Pardo. Alex, how the hell are you doing, buddy? David, I'm blessed, man. It's great reconnecting with you. Always love the energy you bring, bro. Like, no matter when we connect, you're always coming with it. So I'm excited to be on here, man. Yeah, buddy. Life is short, man. If you don't enjoy it, 100%. Ducks, right? No doubt. No doubt, Ducks, man. Well, Alex, I obviously know a lot about you, but the audience probably doesn't. Alex, who are you and what do you do, brother? Fill us in. Yeah, man, and I'll try to keep this short and sweet. Born and raised in Miami. Uh, my parents are from Cuba, so if you detect an accent, that's where it's coming from. Uh, you know, I, I did not grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth, and I also didn't grow up, like, in poverty, you know, and I I was in the middle class. My parents taught me, I'm sure, like many of your listeners, to go get a good job and, and you know, go to school and the whole nine, and I started to really immerse myself. Once I uh, graduated from FIU, which is a, a university here in Miami, I went to go work for General Electric in their financial management program. And uh, brother, I've always said I'm not good at a lot of things, but one of the things I'm pretty good at is trying to get clarity about what I want and then reverse engineering how to get there. And I thought when I started working at GE that I wanted to be a CFO or a CEO of a really, really big company. And if I'm being honest with you, I think that was probably more ego driven than anything else, because when I looked at my boss all the way up the ladder, I would not trade places with them no matter how many seven figures their salary was. And I had a two year commitment. So I finished that program, moved back to Miami. By the way, 25 years old, moving back in with my parents is not how I drew it up. Uh, so I had a lot of motivation to figure out the next step. I knew I wanted to start a business, just didn't know quite what that looked like. And I decided to go backpacking around Europe, visited uh, 53 cities in 21 countries in three and a half months wow. on a $7,000 credit card limit. I was able to accomplish that's that. That's it, man. That's it. Wow. So, dude, it was it was on the Euro Rail, which is the train that takes you from country to country, city to city in Europe, that I started to immerse myself in personal development books, a lot of the classics, which I won't bore the audience with because you guys know what they are. Uh, but thinking grow rich, I'll mention one of them had just really expanded my mind to what was possible. Moved back to Miami. Uh, this was October of 2005. And I ended up attending a marketing for deals bootcamp, uh, put on by a gentleman, uh, by the name of Dave Lindahl. Uh, some of you might know he's a big apartment guy and I learned how to, how to market for deals. So I got home, I plucked out a pre-foreclosure letter. I went to, uh, at the time it was Kinko's, it wasn't FedEx Kinko's. I photocopied pre foreclosure letters and I sent out my first direct mail campaign. Fast forward roughly two to three months later, ended up closing our first deal. I brought in a partner because I was too afraid to do it on my own. And we ended up splitting 44,000 bucks. And that wholesale? Was, uh, what was that? Is it a wholesale? It was a pre, it was a pre foreclosure, it was a short sale that we ended up wholesaling to somebody. So my first deal was an actual short sale. And then we we basically uh, short sailed it. So yeah, man, made forty four grand. 
Uh, I thought every deal from that point was going to be 44 grand and up. And I had a, a big bucket of cold water thrown on me that that's not the case. I think I hit it out of the park on that first one. But yeah, man, once I got a taste of that, David, it was, uh, I've pretty much been unemployable ever since. Man, I freaking love it. Are you still in Miami? I am. Yeah. Born and raised. Yeah. Still Miami. That's awesome. All right. Well, obviously the podcast is everyone's a millionaire. So we know because you are here that you have a net worth of at least 1 million. What did you do to get that 1 million net worth? Man, that is a loaded question. I, I'm going to give you my gut. Hard. My I'm going to give you my gut. Re- the first thing I did was I decided that I wanted to be wealthy. I love right? that. That is the first thing I did. Everything in life, in my opinion, begins with a decision. If you don't decide, it's hard to commit. And if you don't commit, you can't get to where you want to go. Right? So that's the first thing is decide that you want to become a millionaire. Decide that you be, want to become wealthy, whatever that might be for you. Right? The second thing is, is I educated myself and I surrounded myself more importantly, because education is abundant. Like you can get education anywhere and everywhere these days. When I got started in 2005, that wasn't always the case. I was going to boot camps and buying books and things of that nature, but um, decide, educate yourself. But most importantly, I think it's so important that you immerse yourself in the right communities, the right environments. Um, I realize it's somewhat of a boring answer because I think Inherently, most people, David, know that coaches and mentors are important. Uh, but I remember in 2007, when I lost $51,000 on my first luxury fix and flip, I did so because I viewed coaches and mentors as an expense. And I, to this day, you know, over 750, almost 800 deals I think I've closed in my career, um, that has been the best deal of my career, losing 51 grand, because that was the catalyst to now view coaches and mentors as one of the best investments in myself. And ever since, ever since 2008, I've had multiple coaches and mentors. To this, right now, I have four coaches in different areas of my life. Uh, So loaded question, but if I had to distill it, I would say decide, educate yourself, coaches and mentors. And then you have to be so intentional about execution. It's not gonna fall in your lap. You gotta do the work. No substitute for the hard work. Do the hard work, believe in yourself. Uh, make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and you keep going and growing. Yeah, I love it. That was that was an awesome answer. I love that. All right, number three. What was your biggest financial mistake or setback, and how did you recover from it? So you kind of already mentioned that. Well, you know, but maybe well, that wasn't you, the answer to that question, though. It, it wasn't. In 2009, and I'll, I'll share the brief version of the story with you, but in 2009, I was living in a, in a condo in Brickell, which is a nice area in Miami. I went down to the mailbox. I was living on the ninth floor, grabbed a bunch of mail, Got back up to my apartment, threw it on the on the kitchen counter, and you ever you ever like have one of those defining moments, like something in your gut tells you like something's off. Well, there was a big envelope that was like protruding amongst the others. I grabbed it and I saw certified mail. It's a green sticker, and then I looked at who it was from. It said Internal Revenue Service. Mm-hmm. Well, brother, I opened it up and I realized that I had about one hundred and twenty six thousand dollars in back taxes penalties and fines because my 2006, seven and eight taxes were never filed. Well, I mentioned to you, I mentioned to you how I didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs. And when I got started in real estate, like I just dove in, I'm the type of dude that like I fire and then I like aim. And many times that serves me, but in this case it didn't. I hired a bookkeeper, abdicated the responsibility of bookkeeping and taxes, thinking he was doing that. And I wasn't like, let me just do deals. Like, that's what I want to do. And man, over the course of three years, it was a painful lesson, but an extremely valuable one. Not only did I pay off, I was making too much money leading up into 2009. So I didn't qualify for what's called an offering compromise. And so over a three-year period, not only did I pay off the IRS, all the money I owed them, but I paid off roughly $38,000, $39,000 worth of credit card debt as well. And it was such a painful but valuable experience and learning lesson, one that I share openly now because I don't want people to fall into that trap of abdicating important responsibilities like bookkeeping and your taxes. I mean, it sounds basic and obvious, but I was like out of sight, out of mind. Like somebody else is handling that. Let me focus on what I'm good at. And I think there's some value in that, but you got to trust but verify. You can't just abdicate. 100%. So that was a setback. How'd you recover from it? Just slowly well, just plugging away at it or just being disciplined? That, well, I hired I hired a coach. 
I hired a coach. I had to get my mind right. I was in victim mentality for way too long when that happens. I remember driving out in late 2009 to go meet with a bankruptcy attorney. And I remember getting emotional on the way to that uh, to that meeting. And that bankruptcy attorney gave me one of the biggest gifts I've ever been given is something felt wrong in my gut. Like I, I felt like I was taking the easy way out. Um, and at the end of the meeting, I told him, I said, I don't think I'm going to move forward with this. And he said, you have no choice. How are you going to pay this back? And I'm the type of guy, man, when you challenge me, like, like I come out swinging. Well, I left the meeting. I didn't file. And I committed at that day. I decided back to one of my, you know, one of the things I shared earlier, I decided not only am I going to pay this off, I'm going to learn from it and I'm going to grow from it. And, uh, and yeah, man, that's exactly what I did. I hired a coach and then I put my head down and I, I did the hard work. Man, that's awesome. I love it. All right. Number four, can you share some specific tactics and strategies and or uh, that you've used to increase not only your income, but also your wealth? Yeah, well, uh, self-storage is the easy answer. I, I wholesaled for 16 years. Uh, I've been involved in real estate for a number of, and done a number of transactions. But, you know, the irony, David, is I got into real estate because I wanted cash flow. I wanted to build wealth and I wanted time freedom, which is ultimately, I think, what people really want is options. And yet I got I think I got addicted to the income that you generate from wholesaling. And then you know, 14, 15 years into my journey, I, I looked up and I said, like, where are the assets? Like, where's the cash flow? I feel like I'm only as good as my last deal. Yep. And I got so tired of chasing deals. Like I got so burned out by the process that um, in 2020, when COVID came, it was a blessing because I it was a reason to accelerate the process of unwinding this wholesale operation that I had built that required 40 to 45 grand a month to feed just to keep going. Well, I completely stripped everything. I sold off some of the assets of the business. Of course, I didn't build a business that was sellable, to be brutally honest with everybody. And um, I took a little bit of time off to really think about what I wanted. I was coaching somebody at the time that owned the storage facility, and I got an inside look into what a powerful asset class it is, especially if you want cash flow, you want to build wealth, and you want time freedom. And yeah, fast forward to today, I have uh, 838 units, 104,000 square feet, and I feel like I'm just scratching the surface, man. So uh, the, the, that's the long answer. The short answer, make sure that your earned income is going into assets that produce cash flow. Rinse and repeat. Man, I love the 848 units. That's a ton. And make sure that earned income goes into assets that produce cash flow. Guys, if you're not listening, you need to be listening. That's amazing. All right. We've already kind of talked a little bit about coaches and whatnot. This question is going to be more tailored towards that. So question number five, did you have any mentors or role models who influenced your approach to wealth building? And I'm not asking who these people are. I'm asking, how did they help you? Wow, that's such a great question. I've had so many that I have a hard time like just thinking of one or two. I've had numerous. Um, and I mentioned earlier in the podcast, David, how I have today, I have four coaches. I have one that has really encouraged me that net worth is something that should be tracked on a weekly basis. And up until earlier this year, I wasn't doing that. So now I track my net worth on a weekly basis. And if your network isn't going up, sometimes a week is a very short time frame. but if your net worth is not going up every single month, it's an opportunity to look at what you're doing and ask what needs to change or what needs to tweak. So your net worth should be going up every single month, right? Um, and one of the things that that has been instrumental is the book Profit First, right? The concept, the idea of paying yourself first. Um, I first got exposed to that when I read The Richest Man in Babylon, George Great book. Klassen. And that's when I got exposed to, hey, you know, 10%, like pay yourself, right? Um, and so for me, it's tithing, right? It's first fruits, giving back to where I get my spiritual food. And then after that, it's paying myself first um, and being very intentional about making sure that the money I'm generating is going into certain buckets and asset classes. You know, 50% real estate, 20% S&P 500, 20% uh, cash. And then uh, and then you can get into more like speculative things like crypto and a small, tiny, tiny little percentage of that, right? So, um, so yeah, to this day, I owe a lot to this uh, mentor I'm working with now that has been very, very, um, he's gotten me very focused on making sure that I'm tracking and measuring my net worth. Man, I love that. I track mine um, once a month at a minimum, just like you. Yeah. I think you're doing it weekly, actually, which is amazing. 
Uh, but you should be doing it at least once a month. And I'm pretty new to it as well. Maybe six or eight months I've been doing that. You know, prior to that, it was like quarterly, which is still better than annually. But uh, yeah, monthly at a minimum, I think, folks. And if you can do it weekly, I think that's amazing. I love it. And pay yourself first. Great answers, Alex. I love that. All right, number six. How do you balance risk and reward when you're making your investment decisions? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think you have to be clear about like how would you define risk and reward, right? Like uh, what stage of life are you in? Are you super young and ambitious and you can take more risk? Or you, you know, uh, do you have some years and experience behind you and maybe you don't see your, your uh, foresee yourself working that much longer? So I, I think that question is going to, the answer is going to be different for everybody. So I think you have to just be very clear on what you want. What stage of life are you in? How do you define uh, risk reward? What kind of success are you after? How do you balance risk and reward? Oh man, you're so on uh, stage. Yeah, I mean, man. So I'll, I'll, everything you said, Alex, a hundred percent. Yeah, this is about you. This is about yeah. The I'll, 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 so this is how I would answer that question. High risk for me is something that I don't have specialized knowledge in. I love right? that. And, or or where I don't have a relationship with an operator who I trust. Because I can put my money into something else if it's with an operator that I trust, respect, has a proven track record, and you know he can do his thing, right? But like, I typically don't invest in anything that I can't put, like, on a small piece of paper or the back of a napkin, something that I can't explain to something in a very simple way, and or something that I don't have specialized knowledge. And that's why I have always tended to like lean on real estate because I understand real estate. I have specialized knowledge. That's kind of the world I live in. But like. Like I do very little investing in crypto and things like that. Not because I don't believe in the blockchain per se, and this isn't a conversation about crypto, but because I can't fully explain it with confidence. And I, I just, for me, it seems very speculative. And, and that's just one example. You can replace crypto with whatever. Sure. Um, but for me, that's what I de uh, define risk as. Um, and I think every investment, you have to go into it knowing what your exit is, whether it's real estate or anything else. Um, getting clear on, are you investing for cash flow? Are you investing for equity? Uh, so those are some of the questions that I like to ask myself as I evaluate risk. And the older I get, the less, the less do I want to swing for the fences. Yeah, a, same. because I don't necessarily need to. Um, and B, because, you know, when you swing for the fences, naturally, most of the time, you, you tend to take on a bit more risk. So you're going to strike out a lot of times when you do that. I define risk very similar. Uh, it's not having the ability to manipulate the outcome. And with real estate, you have control to manipulate. You can, well, well, you know, do it. people in, you can get rid of people, you can make upgrades, you can reduce expenses. When you just buy something and sit back and pray, you don't have any ability to, to really do much other than pray and hope for the best. So great answer. Yeah, to, to your point, last thing I'll add here is that's the reason I transitioned from single family into commercial because in commercial you can force the appreciation. Yep. Right, which is which is one of the things I love about storage. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely. Okay, number seven. This is probably my favorite question here. Looking back, what advice would you give to your younger self about building wealth? Stop looking externally for things to change and start focusing internally, right? So somebody wise, and I, I'd love to give them credit, I just don't recall who I probably heard this on a podcast or read it in a book, but if you want your external world to change your external reality, you got to first focus inward. And I remember coming up, I was too focused on like the external. And if I'm being honest with you and very vulnerable, like I was too in my head and concerned about what other people would think. And the older I get, the more I realize that like, first of all, like I was giving myself way too much importance. People aren't thinking about me. People aren't necessarily looking at me, no matter how much success I achieve or don't achieve, right? Like people's attention spans, we were talking about this is like this and they don't give a crap about me, right? And they probably don't give a crap about you, uh, generally speaking, right? Like out outside of a pretty tight circle. Um, and so stop worrying about what people that don't, are not going to be at your funeral, uh, what they're going to think about you, what they're going to say about you, like take chances, right? Like, and here's the flip of what I just said. Like when I say take chances, I say, be intentional, make sure that you're, that you're putting yourself out there. Make sure that you're intentional about execution because earlier on I was too reserved and I wasn't, I almost didn't start the flip Empire show, which I, to this day, I'm still doing eight years later. Because I was too concerned and in my head about what if I say something wrong? How am I going to sound? How am I going to look? 
And that would have prevented me from a lot of doors and relationships that have been built over the course of that time. So put yourself out there is what I would say. And that, by the way, that leads to building wealth, that leads to confidence, that leads to so many things. The look inside. I love it. Great answer, man. That's awesome. Two more questions and we'll wrap it up. Cool. What additional advice would you give to the audience that's here today? So keep in mind, the audience is mostly consists of people <laughs> that are not yet a millionaire. They have not yet reached a 1 million or plus net worth. And they're here listening to you and me and all these other investors and, and individuals who have. So outside of what we've spoke about today, what advice would you give somebody that's you know still trying to get there? Yeah, yeah, and we've touched on some of it, but um, I'll start here. And this might be an unpopular answer and might turn some people off. Hopefully you're okay with that, David, but this is just my personal sure. opinion. Is um, tithing, I would say, has had a massive impact on my life, right? Like first fruits, giving, giving back to whether it's the church or where you get spiritual food. There's a book called The Four Spiritual Laws of Prosperity that whether you believe in tithing or not, or you're spiritual or whatever, like I highly recommend everybody read that book. Um, so that would be the first thing, um, investing in yourself, uh, putting yourself out there, hiring coaches and mentors, reading at least 10 pages a day. Like this is a book I just finished reading. Like look at all these dog years. Every single day I am reading and then I'm writing notes on what I'm going to implement, right? So um, I have an executive assistant. I think if if you're if you're serious about building wealth, I think one of your first hires needs to be not a virtual assistant, but an actual executive assistant, somebody who manages your calendar, your inbox that is clear on what your priorities are, what are your rocks, and then you prioritize that on the calendar. If you were to if I was to pull up my calendar, you'd see focus blocks, you'd see drive revenue blocks. Um, so everything is like, it's like a waterfall. Like I get clear on what I want to do for the year. I chunk it down to the quarter, chunk it down to the month, the week, and the day. Um, and so, yeah, that, that there's a lot more I would share, but for the sake of time, like that's where I would start. I'm sure you're familiar with Dan Kennedy's method or book about having the focus days and the uh, buffer days and yeah, which book is that? I I know I've read it three or four times. Oh man, I've read so many. It's probably one of his no BS books. Yeah, something like that. Dan it might be in his no BS series. I love it. I love it. All right, good deal. Alex, thank you for being here. What is the best way to connect with you? If somebody wants to learn more about you, investing in storage, working yeah, with you on deals, getting coaching from you on deals. I'm sure you got some social handles, a website, you know, so on and so forth. If somebody's here today and they're like, man, I really resonate with Alex. I really like the things that he said. I want to learn more. I want to connect. Where do we send them? Man, well, I'm going to go ahead and give my mobile number. Believe it or not, I want to connect with people. I'm really big on building relationships with the right people. So I have some valuable resources for anybody that might be interested in storage as an asset class. Um, yeah. Text me. Just text me the word storage. Let me know you heard me on David Dodge's podcast. Uh, 305-318-6213. 305 Say that one more time. Yeah, 305-318-6213. Just text okay. me the word storage and I'll send you some valuable resources. And then I've been hosting a podcast called The Flip Empire Show, which you can find on uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify, all the platforms for just over eight years now, man. So 750 plus episodes and I'm still podcasting, which is wild to me. Holy cow, man. That's amazing. Eight years, 750 episodes. And you're giving the audience your cell phone number, man. You're the yeah. first person. I think this is like, episode 19 or 20 and you're the first person to give out their cell phone number amazing guys text alex storage give me that number one more time man yeah 305-318-6213 hell yeah alex anything else that you want to add no man honestly I'm, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to share and give back and look by all means i don't have everything figured out i make mistakes i have challenges just like you just like every everybody else like David and I aren't special, right? We just put ourselves out there. We take action. We make mistakes. We learn. And we just continue to go and grow. So uh, so that's it, man. If I, if I can help people in any way, just uh, feel free to reach out. Awesome. Alex, thank you so much for being here, man. It's great to connect with you. Alex is the real deal. Known this guy for, I don't know, seven, maybe even eight yeah. years at this point. Probably. And um, he is doing awesome stuff. 848 storage units absolutely crushing it guys thanks for tuning in today everyone's a millionaire we believe in you you got this put together a plan one of my favorite quotes is a uh, goal without a plan is a dream 
We're not dreamers here, guys. You got to have goals, but more importantly, put together that plan and execute. Until next time, signing off. And that's a wrap for today's episode of Everyone's a Millionaire. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion and that you've gained some valuable insights and ideas to help you build and grow your own wealth. We want to thank our guests for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. And we also want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in and joining us on this journey of financial discovery. If you've enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to reach out to us on our website or on social media. Remember, at Everyone's a Millionaire, we believe that wealth is within reach for everyone. And we're here to help you achieve your financial goals. So until next time, keep hustling, keep learning, and keep building your wealth. Signing off. <laughs>